Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Marjon Live. This session is for the Masters in Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, my name is Siobhan and I'm going to be the producer for the session today. Um, I just want to go through a few housekeeping things with you before we uh, start the session. Uh, for those of you who've not used uh, Microsoft Teams Live before, uh, just so you know that we can't actually see or hear you today, um, but it doesn't mean that we don't want you to interact with us. We're really keen for you to ask us questions um, and we will do our best to answer those throughout the session. So if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you should have two speech bubbles, one of which has got a question mark on the top. And that's where the live Q&A feed is. So if you've got any question at all, uh, you're welcome to pop that in there. Um, please do bear in mind that actually uh, these these messages and questions will be published. So if you'd rather remain anonymous, that's absolutely fine. Or you could just pop your first name in there. If you've got a question that you think is more personal, but you would still like to ask, just put private at the start of the message and I'll make sure that we don't publish that. So I'm joined today uh, by Ryan, who is a student ambassador and a student at Marjon, uh, and also by John, who is uh, delivering the session today. Um, so Ryan, would you like to just introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Ryan. I'm a third year acting student at Marjon. That's brilliant. Thank you. So Ryan will be able to answer your questions on student life at Marjon. Um, so please do pop those questions in the feed as well. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to John. Unfortunately, we won't be able to see John today because we have had some uh, connection problems, but um, we are kind of hoping and um, fingers crossed that everything on the presentation will be running smoothly for you. So we thought it better uh, that you'd be able to see that as well. Um, so I will hand over to John now. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's John. I'm uh, one of the lecturers on the uh, Masters in Osteopathic uh, Medicine degree, which we're here to uh, discuss and talk about today. And um, yeah, so if we start, I'll, uh, I'll just skip on to the next slide. So like I said, my name's John Evans. I'm uh, taken over from Gary Shem as programme lead from September 2020. Um, so for the, the first years and, and they're going forwards, I'll be programme lead. Um, What's my experience and who am I? So uh, I'm an osteopath. I'm a uh, registered osteopath. I've been an osteopath in practice for about 15 years. Uh, I've been in higher education for about uh, eight years as well. Um, I've been part of the marginal team here um, since we started the degree course, uh, the osteopathy degree course. Um, and it's been uh, it's been a really good experience and I've really enjoyed being part of uh, Marjon. Previous to that, I worked at Oxford Brooks uh, on the osteopathy team, Swansea and in the BSO as well, so the British School of Osteopathy. The page you're looking at at the moment um, basically uh, has your UCAS number on, so if anybody needs to apply or wants to apply through UCAS, so that would probably be for uh, 2021, the code you'd need is 24M4. If anybody hasn't applied and is looking to apply this year, um, that would probably be done through a direct application, which would be done um, via admin. So I'll make sure the, there's a link or a, an email address that's easy to find uh, for any direct applicants that wish to go that route. OK. So the Masters of Osteopathic Medicine, the MOST, is a four year integrated uh, undergraduate and master's degree. What this means is the first three years is a um, effectively an undergraduate degree with the final year being the uh, master's degree. To graduate as an osteopath and be registered with the General Osteopathic Council, you do need to complete all four years and um, finish your master's degree in order to do such. Um, we'll talk about the General Osteopathic Council in a moment and what all that means. The, um, the, the osteopathic degree. So, Something that we tend to do, if you're all here live, is I'll ask you, what is an osteopath? Um, and, uh, and and what we all think about that, because there is some sort of confusion, I believe, at times. So an osteopath, we are in, in manual medicine, yeah, obviously, but there is much more than just manipulation, soft tissue techniques, OK? It's more than just joints, muscles and spine. Um, to be a good osteopath and to understand and to learn at this level, you really need to look at the pathology, the neurology, orthopaedics, visceral anatomy, um, differential diagnosis. So it's a very intense course and, um, and we cover all of this obviously on the course, um, but it's a lot more than just your, your sort of um, soft tissue techniques and manipulation. There is a huge amount of academic work that we also need to uh, put in. 
academic study that we need to put in. Okay, so um, at Marjon, we are registered or recognised by the Generosity Pathic Council. Now there is a hyperlink up on the screen now um, and that will be made available later. And this is just the GEOSC website. So if you go and have a look at that, that will tell you about registration, becoming osteopath training courses. Um, we are the only provider in the Southwest and one of only about nine in the country. Um, the General Osteopathic Council will regulate osteopathic training and regulate osteopaths. Uh, so anybody calling themselves uh, an osteopath um, that hasn't isn't trained or isn't registered with the General Osteopathic Council is committing a crime effectively um, is a protected title and um, the general the general osteopathic council will um, basically go after anybody that is pretending to be an osteopath um, so when you graduate from Marjon, you are straight onto the register and you are a registered osteopath and you can call yourself an osteopath we are at Marjon. we have um, our osteopathic clinic in the sports center and uh, so basically on campus and we have all of our uh, lectures sort of done on site as well um, obviously there will be a slight change moving forward to that so if we just have a, a some of you may have come and seen Marjon, and some of you haven't but obviously with Marjon here we've we've been delivering um, higher education or high quality education for over 175 years and one of the main or well, the key factors I think we have at Marjon is the facilities that we have so not just the facilities that we have in sports centre which are you know world class with a, a swimming pool strength and conditioning gym uh, rock wall we've got a you know a load of equipment and a load of facilities for you as students but we also have top-notch facilities for research uh, which we'll talk about in a few moments as well so Marjon really does deliver uh, fantastic abilities for you as a student and for you as a growing professional. The osteopathy degree uh, or the osteopathy program is part of the School of Sport Health Sciences and Wellbeing. Okay, um, the few little pictures we've got on here are just some examples of the equipment that we, we have available to us. We obviously have uh, coaching development, we have uh, this this guy with his little hat on in the bod pod. This is sort of a a, a, a metabolic fat analysis, so we'll tell how much fat's around his liver and and how much fat's on his body. Um, the guy on the little treadmill on the the far right. This is an anti gravity treadmill. So the idea of this is we can take up to sort of eighty percent of somebody's body weight away and uh, still get them to run and still get them to walk. So you might want to use this as part of your um, uh, treatment program when you get into the third year and you're treating patients so you might decide that they've got some arthritic hips or arthritic knees and one of the best things would be some rehabilitation and we need to get them moving so we can offset up to 80 percent of their weight by using these facilities um, the, the the clinic rooms you can see just at the bottom um, so we run currently a seven plinth i'm sorry an eight plinth clinic um, so up to eight consultations at one time. One student, sorry, one student, one uh, tutor will only ever be responsible for four clinical consultations at any one time. So it's a one to four ratio, which is standard with all General Osteopathic Council uh, industries. Um, so what this means is it means we can always deliver good quality education and safety, which is obviously of paramount importance. If you look on to the bottom right, we see um, sort of the biomechanics lab, which we have set up with motion analysis, um, foot posture index, foot posture uh, analysis, golf swing analysis. So all of the equipment that is available through the sports and health sciences and wellbeing um, units will be available to you as a, an undergraduate osteopath, which means from a point of view of your um, ability to deliver treatment, it improves that obviously, and your ability to uh, diagnose, but also it's very useful for research. You might decide you want to do something on the, you know, the anti-gravity treadmill, the, the foot-based analysis, the, the movement analysis, and at margin we have the facilities to really enable you to develop some good um, research moving forwards. Oh. 
Sorry. There we go. Um, so the degree structure. So many of you would already uh, understand and know this, but like I said, it is a, a master's degree. So it's an undergraduate master's degree. So it's a full year, full time master's degree. It is full time. Um, the first and second year uh, are very full time sort of academic and practical wise. And when you get into the third and fourth year, which is the majority of your clinic hours, they will be um, you will be basically on on campus most of the time, uh, Monday to Friday. Um, so years three and four, <clears throat> we cover nearly a thousand hours of mandatory clinic placement. So I think it's, it's about 850, I think, because we do the first 150 in years one and two, which will be observation only. But years three and four, you'll do 350 hours in year three and um, 400 hours in year five. Sorry, in year four. And that basically means because the General Osteopathic Council has said that we have to do a thousand hours as mandatory with all uh, osteopathy programs and you have to see a minimum of 50 uh, new patients. So what we do, which is slightly different here from a lot of other um, osteopathic structured institutes at the moment, is we actually we don't run all the way through the summer. Um, so most of the other schools, in fact, all of the other schools will run through the summer. So the clinic will run and it will basically reduce the amount of time you have on your in your summer break significantly. What we've done at Marge on here is we've actually the first year we, we've closed the clinic for the summer and then moving forward we will have a uh, intern system. So we'll use fourth year graduates to basically uh, run the clinic. So therefore all of our students get a good sort of summer break. Um, and a good uh, Easter and everything break so they can sort of uh, come back feeling revived and fresh. In year one and two, you have uh, placement opportunities. So you will be doing your 150 hours in the marginal clinic over year one and two, uh, just observation only. But if you wanted, there's also opportunities to observe in the sports clinic, in uh, the NHS and the hospitals and the GP surgeries. We've got great links with the NHS around here. Um, and so that's been something that's been, been done in the past and it's been really useful for uh, the students to do so. OK, so moving on to the structure of the degree. Uh, year one. So these are all the modules that you'll be covering in year one. So engaging with learning, professional, personal development, human physiology fun and functional anatomy. Uh, osteopathic skills one, biochemistry, biophysics, personal professional development one, and musculoskeletal biomechanics. So throughout these modules, there, there will be some overlap. So for example, biochemistry and biophysics, we look at neurology as well. And during neurology, we will also do a practical element of this, which will be your, <coughs> excuse me, uh, your neurological testing. So deep tendon reflexes, muscle powers, uh, and things like that which will have a massive overlap into osteopathic skills one and personal professional development. So all of the modules do have significant overlap, but we found that doing it this way uh, just basically builds on the experience and builds on your ability to take on this information. Uh, if we look at um, personal professional development, what we would do in this module is we will discuss how you become a professional. We will look at how what it means to be a professional. And also look at the keystones of how the GEOSC function and uh, also included in that will be uh, case history skill and uh, your palpation skill, so examination skills. So it's, it's a big module that runs across two semesters. OK, uh, and then the biomechanics module that we've got sort of underneath that uh, will be obviously all the biomechanics of the limbs, but then on top of that and, and the spine or body. But then on top of that, we start to apply orthopedic testing and, and your orthopedic understanding. So your orthopedic um, academic knowledge will come from your osteopathic skills one. So there's a lot of overlap between the modules, uh, but it means that all of the lecturers have an understanding of what's taught on all the modules, which means that we can educate you in a much more effective way. Uh, hopefully a much more fun way as well. <laughs> uh, so year two, in year two, You'll be looking at your research methods, analysis and sport, physical activities and health sciences, uh, pathophysiology of non-communicable diseases, clinical differential diagnosis, 
nutrition, health and disease, personal professional development two, and osteopathic skills two. So obviously personal professional development two and osteopathic skills two are continuations of um, the, the modules from the first year. The new modules we've got coming in here are pathophysiology and uh, clinical differential diagnosis. So pathophys is a, a big module again, it's a really important module, and we look at how disease takes hold of the body here, what, what it does, what effects it has to structures, and how it affects your treatment and your management of patients. Um, it's, it's one thing to understand that somebody's got uh, diabetes, but then you need to understand what medication they're on, how the medication affects them, okay, how it's going to affect your treatment, how their condition affects the treatment, okay, what they can and what they can't do. And that's what we start to introduce here. Um, but we start this with the very base levels of understanding the disease. The clinical differential diagnosis module, the one you can see underneath, this module is about how we screen. So you may have somebody coming in in front of you and you need to make a decision of after you've taken your case history, do they have, do they have, uh, I don't know, ankylosing spondylitis or do they just have uh, simple mechanical lower back pain? And in order to, to understand that, in order to be a safe practitioner, you need to have gone through various screens in order to make sure they are safe to treat. And this is something we cover in clinical differential diagnosis. So we teach you how to uh, be safe and effective practitioners uh, through that. And if we move on. Year three. So year three is really where your uh, clinic experience sort of kicks in. So this is the you know this is where it becomes much more fun because you actually get your hands on live patients and it's a, it's a this is where your real learning of how you become an osteopath is or begins you know um the, the year one and two are, are vitally important for you to enjoy year three because if you study hard and you do well in year one and year two year three will be fun if you don't <laughs> study particularly hard and you don't do particularly well and you scrape through in year one and year two year three is going to be really hard and really really stressful for you because you're going to be put in in, in a clinic environment with patients okay um so year one and two are really key the again the the, the modules that we look at here we just talk about here quickly osteopathic skills three continuation of osteopathic skills two pharmacology and toxicology so this is kind of building on the um pathophysiology in year two and what we look at here is is um uh, drugs basically and the effect drugs have on the system so from uh, recreational drugs to uh, you know your warfarin and your medical drugs and your cancer drugs um we will talk and look at these drugs in quite detail quite a lot of detail uh, so again, you can understand what this does to the system, and how this affects your management of the patient. Um, in evaluation, osteopathic evaluation and thera therapeutics, we look at different models and different ways of treating patients. So we may look at sort of a specific adjusting technique, we may look at visceral techniques, we may look at um, uh, um, sort of tensegrity type theory. So it will basically build on the first two years uh, and introduce different models and different ways of treating people. Um, the entrepreneurship is a really important uh, module. Um, sadly, a lot of universities, uh, uh, universities still don't have sort of your, your business models and business management models in yet. And I think they're absolutely uh, pivotal because basically most of you guys will go out and work for yourselves um, or work for uh, an associate or be an associate for another practice, but you will still be running your own small business. And this module really helps you develop and understand how to do that. Uh, clinical practice three, like I said, 350 hours face to face with patients. Uh, we, ho we hope to get you around 20 to 25 patients in year one, uh, new patients that is, but you will see a lot of returning patients as well. <coughs> um, if you want any further information about the clinic, uh, there is a hyperlink there that which we'll make available and you can have a look at the clinic and look at the, the type of things that we do there. OK, so moving on to year four. Year four is um, only three modules, OK? Um, but that's mostly because they're both big, well, the two of them are massive modules. So the master's project and your osteopathic clinical practice are really big modules and managing clinical uncertainty is also quite a a big module. Managing clinical uncertainty 
again, we are a practical module. And what we do here is we try and teach and, and try and get you to understand the the, the clinical grayness, OK, um, that's associated with everything that all musculoskeletal practitioners deal with. Uh, nothing is black and white. You know, you're you're looking at managing an uncertain condition. The only way you will know for certain what this patient has is do, doing bombardery of tests, as in MRIs and CTs and blood tests. But obviously, that's not appropriate because it would be over testing. Uh, and what we do here is we try and teach you to understand how to manage that uncertainty. Um, osteopathic clinical practice two. So again, this is 500 hours. Uh, sorry, I said 400 and I yelled, but it is 500 hours. It basically means you'll be in every day in clinical practice um, and it will be the same as uh, year three. Apart from you'll be being pushed a little bit harder, you've been asked a little bit more questions um, and you'll be expected to be a little more, a little bit more anatomical, uh, not anatomical, sorry. Um, no, that was completely less my mind. Uh, you'll be expected to be a little bit more uh, able to stand on your own two feet and uh, and get on with it, basically. But you will still be supported and supervised the whole time. And then you have your master's project, which obviously is a big undertaking and pivotal to you passing this uh, degree. You'll get lots of support and you'll have your own uh, um, uh, tutor, which will help you with this as well. So I think one of the things that's really nice about Marjon and about the osteopathy course we've got here is we have a multidisciplinary teaching team. So this is made up of osteopaths, physiotherapists, uh, physiologists, scientists, supply scientists, psychotherapists and psychologists. Um, and you only really get that in a university setting because we've got such a, a, a big pool of expertise here. Um, uh, and I think that really sets us apart from many other courses because you get to see different people's approach and different disciplines approach. So it really sort of helps create more rounded individuals. And I think it's really good for uh, osteopaths, so, so our profession as a whole, to have this experience early on. Uh, so like I said, the uh, General Osteopathic Council. Uh, once you finish your four years and you pass, you will automatically be registered with the General Osteopathic Council. And uh, well, this is subject to disclosure and borrowing services, so DBS checks. Um, you have to have had a clear DBS check to be registered with the General Osteopathic Council. If anybody has any concerns or would like to talk about this, then please email me. Um, and my email address will come up later um, but it is important that we are open and honest about that you if you have got something undisclosed and you go through the four years of training and then you have to have this dbs check and they say no there is something that's not been disclosed then um, you will not be allowed on the general Osteopathic council okay so it is really important that you understand the undertaking at this point um, that is across the board. So that is the same with every single university and every single osteopath out there has to be full disclosure and barring services checked. Um, and once you've got that, straight onto the General Health Council and uh, you are free to practice as an osteopath. The, uh, the, the council themselves, they've done a really good job. So what it means is you, you can, with this qualification, you can be an osteopath anywhere in the world, apart from America. OK, so you, know, you can work in Canada as an osteopath, you can work in uh, Australia as an osteopath. The, the, the quality of the education, quality of the, the, what the General Osteopathic Council have done means that the education or the degree trans transcribes those boundaries, so you can work in these different areas. The reason you can't work in America is quite simply because in America, all osteopaths are medical doctors, um, so you have to do an MD, medical doctor before you can call yourself an osteopath in America. Sorry, I've done something here. Right, okay, so uh, that's me. 
that's the course that's been finished. Uh, so this is me, John Evans at marjon.ac.uk. If you'd like any um, further information uh, or if you have any questions, please email me. Um, for any further details, um, you can Google Marjon Osteopathy. And like I said, the UCAS code is 24M4. <coughs> And additional information about the Marjon Clinic is available www.marjon.ac.uk forward slash osteoclinic forward slash. Okay. And I think that's me. That's brilliant. Thank you, John. Thank um, you. We do have some questions that have come in. Um, are there any additional costs, um, e.g., uh, model spines? Oh, Sorry, e.g. model spines lab coats. So I guess are there any costs uh, in regards to equipment that you might need? Um, so with regards to sort of model spines and, and lab coats, I mean, model spines are optional. If they wanted to get themselves a model spine, they can be quite useful. Um, we do have model spines at the university that people use. Lab coat wise, um, you are required to have a, a tunic. Um, but that would, you know, from the, uh, I, I think we actually supply one tunic. Um, it's recommended that you do have more tunics than that, because obviously when you're seeing <laughs> multiple patients over every day of the week, <laughs> you need to wash it quite frequently if you just have one. Um, and the, uh, the only other sort of costs, if you like, that can be accrued is uh, your, your clinical equipment. Now, we have the clinical equipment available, so you do not have to buy your clinical equipment. By that I mean a patella hammer, ophthalmoscope, um, you know, blood blood pressure cuff and sphygmometer. Um, we have all of that available in the clinic and for practicing at the university. But I always recommend that people do, if they can, um, buy their own kit because then they've got that to practice with at home and you will need it when you graduate. Um, but from regards as additional costs, there are you know, apart from books and things like that, there are nothing else they can think of. That's brilliant, thank you. Um, and some other questions on here. Um, is clinic time is clinic time time tabled per student or is there flexibility week on week? No, it is it's time tabled per student. Yeah, it is. Um, so year one and two there is uh, it will be timetabled, but it's it's only a small amount. So year one and two, we're looking at 50 hours over the year. So there is more flexibility with year one and year two being only 100 hours. There is some degree of flexibility, but it is timetabled in. You have to achieve those hours. Years three and four, I, uh, there's not really, you know, there might be a small amount of flexibility, but overall I have to say no, because I need to timetable if I've got 25 students I need all of those students to get 350 hours in year three and all of those students to get 500 hours in year four. So I need to have them timetabled in because ultimately if it gets to the end of the uh, year four and you haven't completed all your hours, you cannot graduate. So it is really important that it is timetabled, I'm afraid. So there's not a huge amount of flexibility there, no. OK, thank you, John. Um, how many students are in an intake? Um, at the moment, we're capping at around 30. Um, so when I say capping at around 30, we're, we're aiming to keep it sort of at around 30. We, 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 we're relatively small and obviously because we're growing as we go along, we don't want to grow too quickly. So we want to make sure that we have all the facilities in place. Um, so we're trying to keep class sizes small. With regards to um, how that impacts you, you will only ever have even even if there was, I mean, there won't be, but even if there was 60 students in an intake, um, we are still doing a one to 10 scenario. So if we're in a practical lab and there are 60 of you, there will be 60, uh, sorry, there will be six uh, osteopaths uh, to support you. If there's one of you, the, uh, sorry, if there's 10 of you, there'll be one osteopath in there to support you. So there's always a one to 10 ratio with regards to practical and a one to four ratio in regards to clinic. Um, but we're trying to keep the cohorts nice and sort of small at the moment because that, uh, that that's that's good for our quality. 
That's great, thank you. Um, and another question here around opportunities for additional training courses, um, such as sports massage. Are, are there any other opportunities for things to kind of supplement um, and for people to get involved in alongside the degree? Uh, I mean, there are, I, I, I can't answer. I know we had some of our, um, our guys do a sports and some sports therapy courses and sports massage courses, um, but they weren't actually to do with our degree in the sense of you, you don't sort of do your first year or your second year and, and then get a massage qualification or anything like that. Um, so there are courses available, but they're not directly done through us as a, um, a university. Um, so, so no, I would say in that sense. OK, thank you, John. Uh, that's all the questions that we've got um, at the moment that have come in. So I will please uh, encourage people to pop their questions in there because um, we have got a bit more time if you'd like to get any questions answered. Um, I wonder if this might be a good time to come over to Ryan, our student ambassador, uh, just to talk about kind of uh, life at Marjon in general, really life on campus. Um, Ryan, do you mind uh, saying kind of what it was that made you choose uh, Marjon as a university? Yeah, absolutely. Um... So for me, choosing Marjon was, um, it was pretty simple because when I went um, on my open day and my uh, interview day, I just sort of got this sense of just a very nice sort of small, close knit community. And throughout my time at Marjon, that's, I mean, that's just grow, grown and grown and grown. I mean, everyone pretty much knows each other um, through sports or courses or, or uh, events that happen through uni. Um, and it's just a really nice kind of chilled, laid back place um, where you can easily meet all kinds of different people. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Ryan. And um, how have you found it kind of once you've been on campus, um, kind of talking a bit about the kind of the Marjon community? Has there been any kind of extracurricular things that you've enjoyed getting involved with um, or kind of meetings, you know, with people from other courses? What kind of what parts of the facilities have you been using? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my first year, I just decided to uh, join the dance team. I, I, I don't really know why, but sort of dance just interested me. Um, so uh, I went to the dance team and there was quite a lot of people who were actually quite talented at dancing so I sort of originally was a little bit sort of anxious about that but they're all just so nice and I learned some new skills I did uh, volleyball um, and I'd never really played volleyball before apart from in school um, but the the guys who run it who I think one of them plays volleyball for he played for England at one point um, but he was just so so sort of nice and mentoring and I actually learned a lot of skills from that and ended up playing um, playing a match for, for the university so there's some, there's some really great stuff that you can get involved in. There's um, uh, in sort of the arts kind of side. Uh, sometimes the university does um, sort of like uh, they'll do like comedy nights and there'll be um, sort of like live open mics where people sing, do poetry. Uh, so there's sort of all the kind of different sort of cultural areas that if you wanted to try something, um, you can do it. And I know there's so many different um, societies at the union is also relatively simple to set up your own society so the continuously new ones coming on and if there is something that you think oh well, I'd quite like to do that then I think the sign up for that's relatively straightforward. Brilliant thank you Ryan. Um, I'm going to come back to you John because we've got a couple more questions that have come in here. Um, Please, can you talk a bit more about um, kind of the patients that that, that um, students might have the opportunity to work with? So is there the opportunity to work with real life patients and how that would work? Hi, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, basically not in year one and two. So year one and two is pure observation, but year three and four, you're in um, clinic. Uh, so you're in the, uh, uh, the teaching clinic and you are working with patients all the time. So you, like I said, you have to do 50 new patients and continuing patients. So uh, currently we run a general clinic, so it could be anything from, you know, somebody with uh, a, a bad, bad neck, headaches or hip pain, knee pain, foot pain. Um, but we, we're constantly working with uh, new patients. So you will be responsible for your own patient um, workload. Uh, but obviously we supply you with those patients. You don't need to go out looking for patients or anything like that. They're all supplied by the university. Um, and that's something that's done on our, our um, on campus uh, clinic. 
Brilliant. Thank you, John. Um, and just regarding the modules that you've gone through earlier, um, are they compuls Are they all the modules compulsory? Yeah. Or um, yeah, OK, so that so they don't sort of pick and choose. They're all compulsory modules that everybody no, all uses. compulsory modules. They, they have to. Yeah. So again, this is down to Geosk. We have to do some quite in-depth um, planning to get recognition from the General Aspatic Council and um, for us to hold our QA status um, with them. So what this means is that yeah, every module has to be done um, because it all ticks off a certain point of um, the criteria that needs to be fulfilled. So yeah, every single module needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions at the moment. Uh, so I don't know whether we can come back over to Ryan again, um, just to kind of talk a bit more about um, your time at Marjon. Um, looking more at kind of um, Marjon as a university and where it's situated, um, kind of what, what sort of thing attracted you to the Plymouth area? Um, is there anything that you think has kind of been been made better by kind of being in the southwest as a university, or also um, by kind of attending a university that's slightly smaller in scale and more campus based? Yeah, um, so I think uh, Plymouth just generally is an area where it's sort of uh, coastal and there's plenty of different beaches where it sort of sits on the sort of, I guess, on the border of sort of Devon and Cornwall. Um, it's so easy to access some of these, some of the great sort of outside spaces. I mean, uh, the university itself is not that far away from the moors, um, which is obviously a lovely sort of outside place where you can walk. Um, there's obviously the Plymouth Ho, which is actually in Plymouth, um, which is the huge lighthouse on the uh, sort of seafront. Um, so I think that just boasts some really nice views and the sort of community down there in summer, a lot of people sitting out with barbecues, people playing sports. Um, it just, I think for me, Plymouth just feels like quite a sort of vibey, sort of happy, uh, down to earth place. Um, and and again, there's so there's so many different facilities in terms of there's um there's a few different little theatres, um, cinemas, some great shopping outlets like uh, Drake Circus, which is sort of like a big uh, shopping mall almost. Um, and then of course um, bars and clubs, and there's multiple different varieties for places like that, and different foods and cuisines. Um, yeah, so it's just, it just just seems and still is for me. Um, it's the very sort of yeah, a nice sort of chilled place where I always feel relatively safe. Um, yeah. That's brilliant, thank you. I, I wonder if you might be able to talk a bit. Um, we've had some kind of uh, questions in about uh, kind of after university and kind of career expectations and that type of thing. Um, would you be able to kind of share your experiences of the futures team and what, what they're able to offer students at Marjon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I've been in contact with the Futures team um, a few different times um, and they're really good at sort of helping you, well for the future I guess it's in the name, but um, they, they, I mean I haven't used this service but I know they help with uh, CVs and, and applications, there's I think they do interview prep, so I mean I didn't use that because I have a little bit of experience personally myself doing that, but for anyone who hasn't had that experience, um, and I have friends who've done it and said it's been so helpful and um, I know one of my friends was really struggling and he he went to them and got his CV done and he actually managed to get a job um, after that. Um, in terms of like opportunities um, for for just sort of doing outside of uni stuff, um, they also um, I did Camp America, uh, which is where I fly over to America and help in a summer uh, children camp. And the university um, uh, were doing a bursary scheme, so they gave me financial help. They helped me with the application for that. And without that kind of help, especially for me, the financial part of it, I, that wouldn't have been an opportunity for me. And then that sort of in turn is I had I had a really great summer um, and got to got to travel and things. But also for my CV, that's been quite paramount to sort of put me above um, probably some other people coming out of university because it's just sort of another another um, notch on my belt, I guess, um, for sort of experience. Um, and then also I know that um, recently this year, the Futures team, um, I believe it was a bursary called the Going Places Bursary, and 
uh, is really cool. You can basically apply to this bursary um, and you sort of almost pitch an idea. So you sort of give a little elevator pitch of an idea. Maybe that'd be a business or sort of a, um, it's usually something related to how you want to pursue and, and, and push further. So uh, if you wanted to get into writing, um, some people use it for starting up a small business, um, you can apply for a, a set amount of money. I don't know how much that is. Um, and they, based on your application, will see if they can help you with that and if they can't financially, any other ways that they can help you. So, yeah, I do a lot of stuff um, and they're a really, really good part of the uni. That's fab. Thanks for that, Ryan. That's really interesting to hear about. Um, we've had another question in and this one is, is back to you, John. Um, in terms of gaining experience with the NHS and other practices, um, can we begin that in year one or is that something you'd recommend in the later years of the course? Um, and also, is gaining this extra experience something uh, that a student would approach themselves or is this done through the university? Uh, yes, yeah, so we had some opportunities. I mean, these would mostly be done in year one and year two, uh, and they'll be to observe some of the uh, NHS practice. So there's an, an osteopath that works within the NHS down here. Um, so that would be done by the university. Um, we have a uh, like a, a it's, you know, you're only allowed. I think one student is allowed to go at a time. Um, so it, it's done by the university and you basically you would you would ask if uh, you could go and do it basically <laughs> you say you know i think there's a form on moodle that you just fill in uh, and that would come to to me or, or one of the other members in the team and then that would be approved and then uh, we'd look at dates and times when that could be done so it isn't something you could do you you would do off your own back although um some of the students have observed off their own back and made their own contacts with different um practices uh, around the area and um, you know they do that with our support so then the practitioner would say you know is this one of your students and we would say yes and are you happy for them to observe and and we said yes that's been fine but that wouldn't count towards your 50 um, observation hours or your 100 hours um, so your thousand hours has to come from the university clinic and um, so these are like additional um, observations that you can do if that makes sense. That's great. Thank you for that, John. Hopefully that's answered that person's question. Um, we don't have any more questions on the Q&A, so um, thank you to everybody for attending today. Um, I hope you found it really beneficial and you've got all your questions answered there. Um, if anything else does crop up, I know, um, John, you did post your, your contact details, didn't you? So yeah. uh, people are welcome yeah, yeah, yeah. to kind of go back and copy those down and email John. Um, if you've got any queries that are kind of more broadly about the university, then uh, please do contact us. Uh, you can do that on visit us at marjon.ac.uk. Um, and that could be a question about anything. We can field that to the right person uh, and hopefully get some, um, some answers there for you as well. Um, so I do uh, just want to quickly talk to you a bit about uh, Marge on Live and, and what to expect from us kind of over the summer. So uh, Marge on Live is, is running throughout the summer um, and there's various sessions. So um, there are course specific sessions like the ones that you've attended today um, and there's also other talks that you might be interested in. So um, we are doing virtual campus tours at the moment. Um, and we're also doing sessions like Money Matters. So if you've got any any queries about student funding um, or any answers, questions, sorry, that you'd like answered on that. Um, sport at Marjon, so you might be thinking about joining a university team um, to learn about Bucks and also um, kind of the different clubs and societies there. Uh, making your application. There's some sessions for parents and supporters as well. Um, disability support, um, mental health support. Um, so there's lots of different things um, that you can attend and hopefully you'll find those useful. Uh, so I want to uh, thank uh, John for delivering the session today uh, and also Ryan for your contributions. It's been really, really useful to hear um, from a student perspective as well. So, um, so thank you everybody for attending. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to hopefully welcoming you to another Marjon live session soon. Thank you.